Good evening, everybody. Can everybody can everybody hear me? Microphone is good, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Um, welcome. We are happy you're all here tonight, and we are going to get started with our presentation. I'd like to say we're welcoming, on behalf of the Holocaust Education Resource Council, I'm Barbara Goldstein, the executive director, and we are. In Tallahassee, we provide Holocaust education training for teachers and for the community. So this is one of our main events this, this year of um, uh, Holocaust scholars speaking here tonight. And we want to thank Temple Israel for hosting us here tonight. We want to recognize and welcome nationally recognized Holocaust historian Dr. Michael Berenbaum to Tallahassee. He's going to have an engaging discussion on the importance of understanding Nazi Germany's final solution and why it matters today in 2022 and beyond. Dr. Berenbaum is a professor of Jewish studies at the American Jewish University, playing a leading role in the creation of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. He served as the executive director of the, and editor of the Judaica Encyclopedia and authored over 20 books. He's also received his PhD from Florida State University. So when he comes here, See? Well, I usually say, okay, who's graduated from, from Florida State and who raises their hand? Michael. So I love doing that. So, um, but we, I learned today, though, that he got his PhD in what year? 1975. And he still comes back to speak in Tallahassee. And he says he doesn't recognize Tallahassee anymore. North what? North yes, but it's grown. But we're happy he's back here. And so um, he will talk about the power of truth to confront dangerous distortion today and the misuse of history. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Berenbaum up here. And he will have questions after his presentation. First of all, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, I've learned to deeply respect your work and to appreciate your leadership over many years. I'm exceedingly happy to be here for a very mundane reason which is the last time I tried to get here, I was in the airport for nine and a half hours. <laughs> and an airplane just would not take off. Everything else took off, but uh, somehow all of the airplanes there, and I ended up, um, I was going to go from um, Tallahassee, uh, I was going to go from North Carolina to Tallahassee, and then ultimately to Miami the next day after speaking here. And I ended up having to go to New York in order to go to Miami. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out why one had to go from Charlotte to New York and ultimately to Miami. And I think it was a um, 14 or 15 hour uh, day either waiting in the airport or, um, or um, uh, uh, figuring out how to get on the plane. And I'm sort of convinced that there's still someone, and I have lots of mileage. Um, I'm convinced there was someone there without status of, of mileage who's probably still waiting in the airport <laughs> for a plane flight uh, somewhere. So I am deeply relieved. And I came in yesterday in order to avoid the problem, which gave me the opportunity both to uh, see Tallahassee and also equally uh, to speak to uh, Hillel uh, this morning. Uh, I know for a um, absolute detail the day I left Tallahassee because my daughter was, uh, my oldest daughter was born in Tallahassee Memorial Hospital and we left on the 31st day of her birth. So however old she becomes, that's the distance between uh, my life in Tallahassee and they have put me up at the uh, Holiday Inn on, on Appalachian uh, Highway, and um, the irony is I have no idea where I am. <laughs> and, my, and my only recollection, I told this story at the end, my only recollection of Appalachian Highway, which is a, a, a wonderfully, uh, I, was t I had my mother-in-law and father-in-law in the back seat, and my pregnant wife in the front seat, we were going to a restaurant, 
and I stopped at one traffic light and stopped at the second traffic light. After the second traffic light, a policeman pulled me over for speeding. And I asked him, I said, tell me something, sir. I, I may have been speeding, but how do you speed between two traffic lights that are uh, whatever have you? And if I were driving alone, I would agree to plead guilty to speeding, but I have my mother-in-law in the back and my pregnant <laughs> wife in the front. And he looked at me, he said, sir, if you have your mother-in-law in the back, you can go on. <laughs> So, I want to do several things with you today because Barbara gave me multiple responsibilities. She gave me uh, one responsibility to talk very briefly about the Ken Burns series and also to talk a little bit of the, and I want to say it's the Ken Burns, uh, Lynn Novak, Sarah Botstein series because we have to, the problem when you work with Ken Burns is that you're over, sh you're, you're in his shadow and they did equal and masterful jobs on it. But I also want to talk about the evolution of Nazi policy and f uh, talk a little bit about the unknown uh, part of um, the Holocaust that people don't know as well, which is now being massively researched, which is the uh, ho what we call the Holocaust by bullets. And I'm going to show you two very brief um, snippets of films that will deal with it. Um, one on the only film, that, two are the only ones. One is on the only film we have of the actual killing. And the other is on a 10-year-old boy who escaped, um, buried alive, and escaped from the pit. And it's the only testimony I've uncovered about it, and I'm going to give you permission about a third of the way through to, despite what you're hearing, to laugh because of something he's going to say, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. And then finally, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about the impact of the Holocaust today. Let's begin with the um, uh, burns Novik uh, botstein series. If you ask me the overall element of it, I have to say that he did two things, they did two things very well. They first showed that the Holocaust evolved. It did not begin at the end. And consequently, American policy in 1933 was different than American policy in 35, different than American policy in 38, different from American policy in 42 different from American policy in 44, different from American policy in 45. And one of the interesting mistakes that many people presume is that the character and the nature of the evil remain the same. Put it to you very simply, if you want to know, and, and now, interestingly enough, we have to, when we consider the evolution of the Holocaust, we have to consider something we never dealt with at great length before because we were asking different questions. We have to ask you, how does a democracy transform itself and be transformed into an authoritarian and ultimately into a totalitarian government? What is it that happened in the years 1919 through 1933 that led to the dissolution of a democracy and the birth of an authoritarian, ultimately a totalitarian government. That question is sadly deeply and profoundly relevant today. And it has ingredients that are going to sound um, very peculiar. The ingredients include words that you're going to hear like inflation, words that you're going to hear like polarization, words that you're going to hear like deadlock and words you're going to hear like violence. And also one of the elements that you're going to hear which characterizes so much today is conspiracy theories. The ingredients are different. The words sound remarkably what? Contemporary. And 
Consequently, you have to ask what happens and in any writing we do today. And I'm going to give you a, another line that tells you how important it is. Some people voted for Adolf Hitler because he was an anti-Semite. Most voted for him despite the fact that he was an anti-Semite because they felt that in office they could achieve their goals with him in power. Conservative leadership believed that they were men, and I'm being gender specific because at that point it was all men. As men of experience, they could, they could control and um, channel his charisma in the direction they wanted to go. And finally, they also uh, believed that the majesty of office would force him to the center. And consequently, he, and, and ironically, they also felt one other thing, uh, which I'm going to try, because I'm in a synagogue, I'm going to try to express it very cleanly. It's a story about whether you want the elephant on the outside urinating into the tent or the elephant on the inside urinating outside the tent. They felt that once in office, he could be managed and in with responsibilities, the violence that he undertook would not be undertaken. And um, you have all of those elements involved. And we're not only talking about some echoes today, I'm not talking about parallels, I'm talking about echoes today in the United States, but we're talking about echoes in other segments of the world today. And consequently, it becomes of new interest. What does that mean when Hitler comes to power? It means essentially that, uh, and, and the other thing that, that uh, I'm going to put it backwards, Botstein, Novick, and Burns tell us is that the question about American response is a question also about who we are and what we represent and also what we feel our obligation to the outside world is. So let me take you through the parallel paths of America and the Holocaust and see it in a moment. America in 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt came to power. Ironically, he came to power in a month and four days, a month and five days after Adolf Hitler came to power. Hitler came to power on January 30th, 1933. Roosevelt came to power, and this is a, a test for some of you in history, not on January 20th, but on March 4th. Because only after Franklin Delano Roosevelt came to power did America change the transition of power to make it not the March, but January, because they felt that it was too long a period of time between election and inauguration. And I think we experienced a little bit of the problem of that, and, 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 the, wis no, and the wisdom of that. The wisdom is that if the American people have make, made a choice, the transition should what? Should happen reasonably. The difference between Hitler and Roosevelt is they both uh, experienced a 25% unemployment rate and a 40% drop in what we now measure as gross national product. And for both of them, it was uh, what Bill Clinton used to say, it's the economy, stupid. What's the difference? Roosevelt turned the nation one toward another. Hitler turned the nation one against another. And that becomes a pivotal point. But in 1933, essentially, the German goal in policy-wise was essentially to make it uncomfortable for Jews to live in Germany. And therefore, if they felt uncomfortable living as Jews in Germany, they would leave. We heard the word uh, a while back in our political discourse of self-deport they would self-deport. And the reality is that Hitler, when he came to power, did two remarkable things. He first of all consolidated political power. And you can look at a transition in the total collapse of democracy between January 30th and July 14th, 1933. 
And July 14th was chosen deliberately because July 14th is Bastille Day. What is the ideal of the French? Liberty, equality, fraternity. He's creating a very different radical world and even France, when it was occupied, changed from liberty, equality, fraternity. Consolidated political power, consolidated that by uh, first you had the right burning of the Reichstag and with the burning of the Reichstag, the establishment of a martial uh, law and ruling by decree, the establishment of the first concentration camp in Dachau, March 22nd, 1933. And then you had, by July 14th, the Nazi party was the only party that was legitimate in Germany. America's response at that point was to be distressed, but again, no obligation to deal with this situation because we were consumed by what? Our economic troubles. And the question becomes, what do you do in receiving people? And these people are going to take words that we hear. They're going to take American jobs, and they're undesirable. Some of them are going to be communists and, and the like. They're undesirable. Policy evolves, and if you think of it from a German-Jewish perspective, the question becomes, and I'm going to say it in, in the way in which a nasty person a person who wanted to describe it in nasty terms said it, but he said it very colorfully, and it made sense. He said, the pessimist left, the optimist died. Meaning, if you thought life was intolerable and it was going to get worse, you then did, and immigration is always a push-pull phenomenon. You're pushed from where you are, you're pulled to somewhere else, Pull can be opportunity, it can be economic opportunity, it can both be equality, it can be romance. If you meet a, a, a woman you love and she lives in, in another country and you love her, one of you is going to move, you're not going to stay apart. It can be many reasons. Many of our ancestors came to America because they were pushed from Europe and they were pulled to America because it offered what freedom and opportunity and as uh, my grandmother used to say, you know, if you wear small shoes and you take off the shoes at the end of the day, it's a mechaia. <laughs> and she said, I came from Europe. Anybody who wants to speak nostalgically about that world can go back. <laughs> I, I came from Europe. What was the joy of America? It wasn't opportunity. It wasn't freedom. It was the absence of persecution. And boy, is that terrific. Again, a short, small shoe, at the end of the day, you can take it off. So the question became, Jews uncomfortably left, many of them only left a small distance. And notice that he begins with the Otto Frank and the Anne Frank story. And they're instructive because where did they go? They went to the Netherlands. They left in 1933. They went to the Netherlands, which was not far enough away because who could have imagined that there would be what? the invasion of Holland seven years later. So people left, and then it became, as it were, the new normal. And I want you to have an image of a frog. If you put a frog in boiling water, the frog jumps out. You put a frog in water and you heat up the water, the frog ultimately gets burned. Doesn't jump out when it becomes boiling because the frog has gotten used to what the heat involves. The problem with the strategy of self-deportation, what we called forced immigration, was twofold. One is that no country wanted to receive Jews in the number to which they had to leave. And the second problem was structural, which is that Hitler had a second goal articulated in Mein Kampf. And the second goal was that he wanted to expand geographically, and everywhere he expanded, what did he find? More Jews. Best way to say it is the following. Between 1933 and 1938, 
March of 1938, some 150,000 German Jews had left Germany, 150,000 of 525,000. So that's more than 25% of the population left. One night, the Germans walk into Austria, 200,000 more Jews come under their control. They walk into the Czechoslovakia, into first the Sudetenland, then Czechoslovakia, another hundred and some odd thousand Jews come under their control. By the time they invade Poland, they have two million Jews and the refugee, because they only invade half of Poland, the refugee problem becomes more acute. American policy is restricted by immigration because in 1924, we accepted immigration, immigrants only along the racial stock, uh, and I'm using literally language, the racial stock of our founders, and consequently, we gave preference to Anglo-Saxon Northern Europeans, and we didn't want Italians, Irish, Poles, Russians, and also JEWS. Because where were the Jews living? The Jews were living in the East, in Poland, in Russia. Prior to that, immigration was free to America. After that, it was based on a quota system. So we closed just as the Jews were enormously Franklin Delano Roosevelt had one thing on his political priorities, which is the economy. And the policy was, do we have an obligation, because another country is treating its own native population hostily, do we have an obligation to open and change our laws? And the general consensus is, no, the Jews are pushing for that. And then you had a situation in which you needed to apply. If you were in Germany, you needed two documents to come over the United States before you could get a visa, even if you were under the quota system. You had an LPC document likely to become a public charge. And you had one other document, which is you needed a certificate of good conduct to be issued by the Gestapo. And if you're laughing, uh, that means the moment you decide to leave, you're endangering yourself, even though they want you to lead, etc. Situation gets gradually worse. 1935, you have the definition of Jews based on the Nuremberg Laws biologically, based on the religion of your grandparents, not the identity of you affirm, the tradition you practice, the religion you celebrate, the values you adhere to but based on the bloodlines of your grandparents. Bloodlines of your grandparents, you have no control over who your grandparents are, and it led to the bizarre circumstances of priests and nuns and pastors who were defined by the state as Jews, while the church would define them as what? As Christians. And even the Christian churches that protested upon, uh, for these people protested merely for the baptized Christians whom they felt an obligation for, saying that we had an obligation. 1936, you had the Olympics, and Germany for a while quieted down its anti-Semitism. People said, okay, it reached its peak, and now it's trying to go to the, uh, to the basic circumstances, to the you know, family of nations, portray the new Germany. And there was an acute um, participation of the Americans in the Olympics because of the ro ro role of a son of a bitch, I can say that in synagogue, by the name of Avery Brundage. Avery Brundage was head of the American Olympic Committee later in 1972, was the head of the International Olympic Committee, was the man who announced after the Munich massacre the games must go on. Brundage did, uh, fought against the uh, Amateur Athletic Association Union fought against them to have America participate. And he did something quite remarkable, uh, which is um, everybody hears of the great role of Jesse Owens and the embarrassment he posed to Adolf Hitler. The reason Jesse Owens ran the fourth race, which is the 400 meter relay, was because Avery Brundage had benched two Jewish runners, Marty Glickman and Sam Stoller. 
Marty Glickman was a very famous New York-based uh, sportscaster um, who uh, called the Knicks games and the Nets games, was a great athlete at Syracuse University, was a fine runner. And Jesse Owens said, I've won three gold medals. Let these boys run. These were, Jesse Owens was, uh, was 21, Marty Glickman was 19, Sam Stoller was 18 and a half. They, they could call each other boys without being disrespectful at all. Avery Brundage benched him, benched these two guys, feeling that it was less insulting to Adolf Hitler, who was in the stands, if what? If a black man won the Olympic fourth gold medal, than if two Jewish boys did it because they wanted to portray the German nation. When does America get involved in um, considering immigration? It gets involved in considering immigration in 1938. Two things about 1938 become important. One is that Franklin Delano Roosevelt has brought us out of the worst of the economic depression. And he's a lame duck. He's not going to run in 1940. The second about 1938 is you have a buildup, the invasion of Austria in March, the Evian Conference in July, the appeasement in the Munich Conference in September, the expulsion of Polish Jews in October, and then the night that we call Kristallnacht, but it's really now called in German history the November pogroms, the November rights pogroms of 1938 the burning of synagogues, the looting of Jewish stores, the arrest of 30,000 Jewish men. The very interesting thing is that's the moment in which America comes wall to wall against what happened. Why? Because we had already internalized as a nation very deeply freedom of religion. So you had politically you had religiously priests and pastors and rabbis joining against Kristallnacht. This we cannot allow. You had right and left. You had every segment of the political population saying, this we can't have. Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, I can scarcely believe that a civilized people would behave like this. He called the ambassador home. He didn't sever relationships. He didn't sever diplomatic relations, but his was the strongest response there. Great Britain admits 10,000 Jewish children, kinder transport. Now, I want you to ask yourselves, especially those of you who are parents, what does it take for you to imagine what the situation is for a parent to be willing to put their child into the arms of strangers? rather than keep them with them. How bad do you believe the situation has to be that you're willing to let your child, and this is children under the age of 14, 15, you're willing to let your child go to a fate unknown to you, not knowing when you're going to see them. And you understand what I mean when I say the pessimist left and the optimist died. What does it take? We did a film, uh, which is a wonderful film to see with your children and your grandchildren called Into the Arms of Strangers. It's the story of the kinder transport. And the reason it's a wonderful film to see, it's based on the parental, on the most elemental bond we all have, parent and child. And your first instinct after seeing the film is to hug your kid or hug your parent. And if a teenage kid comes out of a movie and wants to hug his parents, the Messiah has come. <laughs> but what it, and one woman has a, a very incredible story. She says, my parents put me on the train. And as the train was pulling out, my father grabbed me off the train. He couldn't part from me. She then went to four different concentration camps, and she said, I never forgave my father until I became a mother. And then I understood. 10,000 
Children are admitted into England. Some of them are very well treated and some of them are treated horrifically. Some are used as maids and, and, and nannies and everything else and some are treated as a member of the family, an unknown faith and the like. What then happens is the Americans say if the British take 10,000, what should we take? 20,000. Robert Wagner and Edith Rogers advance a bill called the Wagner-Rogers Bill to begin taking 20,000 children. Never gets out of committee. Children are going to grow up and they're going to take American jobs. And consequently, we don't do anything at that moment. 1939 comes, and you all know the story of the St. Louis. And 1939 for Germany is until August and early September is a period of time of getting used to this and finishing up the business of the Jews. What's the business of the Jews? Want to Aryanize their businesses. Every Jew now has to be identified, so every Jew has on every identity card a middle name of Israel or Sarah, depending on their gender. And uh, Jews are no longer allowed to ride streetcars, they're no longer allowed to do a whole range of things, and the synagogue has ended its public role. One of the things you have to understand is why did the Germans burn the synagogues? It made sense. A synagogue became, on Monday morning, a immigrant center. On Tuesday, a welfare office. All week long, it was a school for Jewish children expelled from, from schools. On Monday night, it could be a theater. On Tuesday night, it could be an opera. On Wednesday night, it could be an, a, a uh, symphony concert, a poetry reading. Why? Because Jews could not earn a living as musicians or opera singers or actors, so the synagogue began to play that role to give an inner life and also a cultural life. And on Friday night and Saturday morning, it became the safest place for Jews to be once they arrived inside because it was used as a synagogue and they also got messages there. Messages that were elliptical. There's a book called Persecution, the Art of Writing. How do you speak when you can't speak? So let me give you a very simple example. Many of you know the Aleinu prayer. The adoration, we bend our knees and we bow down before the Holy One, before the King of the King of Kings, the Holy One, blessed be He. And Rabbi Leo Beck adds a simple word, but we stand erect before man. What does he mean by changing the Aleno prayer? We stand erect before man means you know what? You don't bow down to these guys. Rabbi, who Rabbi Joachim Prince was forbidden from preaching, so he had the congregation read a word and read a line in Hebrew again and again, where even the people who couldn't read Hebrew gradually understood what he was saying. And all who think against me, all who think evil against me, speedily change their minds and destroy their uh, thinking which is a way in which he said, again, using the prayer as a way of instructing the people as to what is to be expected. And the synagogue plays a significant role, but by 1939, no synagogues. In 1939, you have the event of the MS St. Louis, the ship that sails the shore that goes to Miami, that goes past Miami, tries to get into Cuba, where they have visas, they try to bribe, and the, the ship is this terrible ship and the like. Eleanor Roosevelt tries to pressure her husband. Her husband doesn't lift the finger. Why? The finger he doesn't lift is a very simple finger. He understands two things in 1939 that he hasn't told the American people. Remember, politicians sometimes don't tell the whole truth. I don't have to tell you that. You live in a capital city. <laughs> Sometimes they don't tell any of the truth, but Roosevelt hasn't told the people two things that become pivotal to him. He already hates Hitler. 
He despises Hitler. Hasn't told the American people two things. Hasn't told the American people that he's going to run for a third term, something nobody else has done. And remember, there is a tremendous isolationist wing in American political life. And the second thing is he hasn't told the people is that we're eventually going to go to war. And he's telling them that he's going for a third term to avoid war. But he does something which is very important, which is he moves the Neutrality Act so that we can ultimately uh, lend lease, which is to supply weapons to Great Britain, which happens after the invasion of Poland. Poland is invaded. You have a division between Soviet-occupied Poland and German-occupied Poland. Ghettos are created to contain the Jews. And we know a lot of the story of the ghettos. Let me just say it in this way. The ghetto was ultimately, in retrospect, a place to contain Jews. For the Jews, it was a place to live until. And for the Germans, it was a place to segregate, isolate, and concentrate the Jews until. Neither knew until what? In retrospect, the Jews thought until Germany loses the war, they come to their senses, we're liberated, or how are they going to destroy a half a million Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto? Impossible. So we have to make life of this. For the Germans, it's until a decision is made as to how to murder Jews as to what to do with the Jews, which ultimately becomes what we call the final solution to the Jewish problem, the murder of the Jews, and until the infrastructure is built to annihilate Jews. That brings us to 1940. 40. 1940, you have the invasion of Europe, the conquest of everything in Western Europe, the one exception uh, the, the one exception is, the, actually, there are two exceptions in Western Europe. One is called Switzerland, the other is called Spain. And Switzerland is not conquered, not because what the, the Swiss tell them so strong. We had the Great Alps. But they forget that there is a way from France right into Switzerland, which is right over Lake Geneva. And if you can conquer every other territory, you don't have to go through the Alps. Spain is a fascist country that would have fought with Hitler, but it was exhausted from the Spanish Civil War. And they needed Sweden for foreign currency. Money, money, money. And the only way they could get foreign currency was to go through Sweden with all that that represented. That then takes us to June 1941. And June 1941 is the German invasion of the Soviet Union. And with the German invasion of the Soviet Union, the final solution begins. Think now of American policy as the following. American policy now is not against persecution. It's against wholesale systematic slaughter. That's different. But now America has a very difficult position because we are not in a position, we can't get to Eastern Europe, and there's no rescue from Eastern Europe. The only rescue you have is from southern France over the Pyrenees into Spain, into Portugal, with a boat to the United States. So most of the killing is happening far away, and the most we can do then is to not put obstacles in the hands of those who want to immigrate. And again, we're still neutral until December 1941. And remember, we don't declare war on Germany after Pearl Harbor until Germany does something which is fortunate for the entire world. It declared war on the United States. The greatest favor that Adolf Hitler did to the world and the greatest favor that uh, Adolf Hitler did, ironically, to the Jews, because the only way at that point to end the slaughter of the Jews is to what? 
win the war, but what's the structural problem? Germany is fighting two wars. We are fighting one war. Germany is fighting a world war, and it's fighting a racial war, what it can be called the war against the Jews. And the reality is, if you look at the history at this point, Germany is totally anxious to kill the Jews, more so even than winning the war. And I can show you that in three ways very briefly. Because, first of all, if you wanted to win the war, you wouldn't get rid of Jewish scientific talent. And remember, people like Einstein and Fermi and the entire and tell her the entire atomic bomb came to the United States. The second is the two largest movements to kill Jews occurred in 1942 and 44. In 1942, Germany was fighting a war in the Soviet Union, in which its troops were ill-equipped. It could not supply them with food, could not supply them with warm clothing, could not supply them with ammunition. And it was in desperate straits and it, by the way, it had to do with a very interesting small thing, which is that the Soviet Union, in order to avoid um, invasion, has railroad lines, railroad gauges that are more narrow than the gauges that the rest of the world uses. So you couldn't transfer men and material on one set of railroad cars. You had to discharge them reload, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one of the reasons. The second time that Germany was killing Jews in its most intense is 1944 with uh, the murder of Hungarian Jews. 437,402 Jews shipped on 54 uh, days on 147 trains to destination Auschwitz, at which time America is invading from D-Day America and the Allies invading D-Day, and the Soviet Union is advancing. The trains kept running. The personnel were being used to kill. The killing did not stop, and you have the sense of the meeting of Roosevelt, in which Roosevelt says to a man, my colleague at Georgetown University, we shall win the war, and then we shall save the refugees. Karski says, by then it will be too late. And that becomes it. Now I'm going to show you two things very briefly. But I want you to see, this is a short film, which is the only film that we have of the actual murder. And I want you to look at all of the players, because we deliberately slow it down to give you a view of three players, the perpetrator, the victim, by the way, the local perpetrator as well as the German perpetrator, the bystanders, and I want you to look at what happens here, and then we're going to hear from one man who was buried alive as to what it was like.
Let's now look at the other one. But I want you to see, and, and obviously the question you have to ask is a terrible question. Who brings a kid to this? Who brings a kid to this? And by the way, if you think of some of the postcards that were sent from lynchings, you see that people also brought their kids there. One of the areas of research that's being done now is we are now interviewing 90 and 92 year old people who will remember this occurred in 1941, so this occurred 80 and 81 years, 80 and 81 years ago, and 79 years ago, so if they were 10, they're 89. And we're interviewing these people as to what they remember and what they saw. And they're also pointing out essentially where the killing fields are, and we're discovering that there were more killing fields throughout. And notice, and, and the other thing is, this was not merely a German operation. In Lithuania, two out of three people who were Jews who were killed were killed by Lithuanians. In Estonia, 10 out of 10, 100% of the Jews of Estonia were killed by Estonians. In Latvia, more than 50% were killed by Latvians because they wanted to inherit they wanted to inherit what they, the people they killed because they had tangible assets, farmland and homes and apartments and everything that you have in your own home, from linens to uh, bedding to uh, couches, etc. So you see this, and I'm going to talk in a moment about what the Germans learned from this and how they changed it, but I want you to hear now for one, I want you to look at one thing that we try to do this film, which is a, a very important um, metaphor for understanding. It's the presence of absence and the absence of presence. And this is a tool that we have with all memorialization. If you think, I don't know how many of you have been to the 911 site. But what you have brilliantly done in the 911 site is the original footprint of the two buildings are now pools empty where buildings had risen. And nobody will ever build on those sites. And I want you to see that as you're seeing it, and then you're going to listen carefully. And I hope we'll be able to hear it because his accent is thick. But I want you to listen carefully to what it was like to be buried alive and to come out. by the way, are the pictures from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum's tower. Thank you. 
Listen to that, and you hear the power of testimony that can bring you into a world that can bring you into a world that you could never imagine. And I know that you took oral histories, but you never quite took an oral history like this. But the other, and and it was appropriate that you laugh when he said, "If I'm dead, it's not too bad. I'm seeing. I'm breathing. Uh, I'm listening." Historians had a very interesting thing because we had read again and again that the ground continued to move for several days. We originally thought that that was the settling of the deceased. And little did we imagine that that was the people like him who were struggling to get out. Now notice something else, and I teach this, by the way, as to how to interpret I teach both of these how to interpret a historical document, which I think David Marwell did a marvelous job in showing us what you could see if you see it. And I teach it also here how to interpret an oral testimony. His father had saved him. His father intuitively pushed him into the grave before the shots rang out. And then the question is, is he going to be buried alive? And he discovers to his irony that he's alive. Let me take you to the transition. What was the problem with this killing? It was difficult for the perpetrators. They needed to drink afterwards. They then needed to drink before and sometimes during. And it was also, as we saw, visual, visible to the entire population. That's what brought the next step of the Holocaust into existence, which is, and I'm going to use the word metaphor, but I don't mean metaphor, I mean structure. If you, at first, you send mobile killers to stationary victims, what's the reverse of that process? You make the victims mobile, and you send them to stationary killing centers, which are factories of death, you combine Henry Ford's assembly line with Charles Darwin's survival of the fittest. You employ all the technology involved. You create death camps. And that's the moment at which you can slaughter hundreds of thousands and ultimately 2.7 to 3 million people with a minimum staff. Let me give it to you in figures just for one second. And Mark Twain once said, there are truth, lies, and statistics. Belgians, in existence between March and December 1942, 500,000 killed, two known survivors, and a staff of 104, of whom 14 are Germans, 90 are Ukrainians. Treblinka, in existence from July 23rd, 1942, to August 4th, 1943, 925,000 Jews killed, a staff of 140, with less, uh, of 120, 30 Germans, 90 Ukrainians, 67 known survivors. What does that mean? That means if you structure the killing properly, 44 Nazis can be responsible for structurally killing 1.4 million Jews. That's the moment at which the full ethos of the Holocaust takes shape. We have to ask, and we don't have time to ask about who are the people who endured this, who are the people who perpetrated this? And what is the structure of the evil that we experience which allows this to happen? Now, this is also a way, and, and during this time, America has precious little it can do. 
And even by the time the bombing of Auschwitz was possible, 90% of the Jews who were to die in the Holocaust were already dead. And 85% of the people murdered at Auschwitz were already gone. So there was no easy way out, easy solution to this. And the ultimate truth is that the only way to deal with genocide is to act early and swiftly with military means and also to open your borders. And by the way, if you think of what's happening today, think of that as a very particular lesson. And also the power of resistance is expressed for this generation in the words, don't send me a ticket, send me bullets. And also the enormous interest that we have that Ukraine refugees were now being received in Poland and Romania and Hungary and Germany, white Christians who were less strange. And by the time they had the question of Jewish refugees in the United States, one of the oppositions was the Nazis were going to send spies in the form of Jews. And ironically, the, the um, German Jewish Bund, the German American Bund, had an entire series of spy rings in city after city that were working against American interests. But the issue in America, they're going to send us either spies or communists who are going to organize. So we have this element. Let me conclude and take some questions by saying the following. We have echoes of the Holocaust today. The good news of the echoes of the Holocaust is an achievement of places like Kirk. And that is the Holocaust has become the gold standard of evil. If you want to call attention to what happened, want to call attention to what's happening to your people in anything, you invoke the ultimate epithet, Nazi Holocaust Genocide Hitler. Most of the time it's being invoked, it's, and this is the danger, the danger now is not denial in the classical sense. The danger is vulgarization and trivialization. Let's take an example. Your mask is not a Jewish star. Your mask protects you and protects me. Your mask is a life-saving device. A Jewish star was a way to stigmatize and ultimately to identify and murder Jews. The idea that you can compare masks to what? To Jewish stars means you understand neither, and you're falsifying both. You had uh, this wonderful congressman from nearby southern Georgia who spoke about the gazpacho police. On one hand, it's an idiocy because she can't distinguish between the Gestapo and gazpacho. <laughs> on the other hand, other hand, you have to feel a certain sympathy because the poor woman has probably never had gazpacho, <laughs> which is one of the great summer soups. I mean, if, if you're going to choose, if you're going to choose one of the five greatest summer soups, I think uh, who here wouldn't list gazpacho in one of that? And the Gestapo is certainly not that. And um, uh, you you have all the trivialization. The tragedy of our world. The sadness of our world is that we can't relegate this event to the past and that it echoes, it resonates. The hatred is there, the fury is there, and we have to be able to do better as a nation, and we have to do better as a world. And last line is there's a great Hasidic master who said, sometimes you scream at the world to change the world, and sometimes you scream at the world to make sure the world doesn't change you. We have to do both. Let's take questions. Thank you very much.
Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, let me say um, that people uh, uh, people tell me um, why uh, there are people who hate Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And my response to that is, what was the alternative? And the best way of, uh, by the way, in 1940, the opponent of Franklin Delano Roosevelt was Wendell Wilkie. And by that time, both of them were interested in not in American isolationism, but in American participation. And Charles Lindbergh represented the American First Movement. He was a man who was given an award by Adolf Hitler who wanted to live in Germany and wanted to isolate America from the rest of the world instead of engage America in the rest of the world. And the most important treatment of that is ironically in a novel by uh, Philip Roth called The Plot Against America. And if you're going to read one book of this era, it's Philip Roth's Plot Against America. If you don't want to read the book, take a look at the HBO television series, which is faithful to the book. But to give you an idea of how, well, Roth is a, is a great writer, even if you don't like what he's writing about. But to give you an idea of how great a writer he was, I, uh, halfway through the book, did something, I looked at the ending to make sure that I wasn't imagining the history that I thought I knew, and that he didn't run. But we would have been a very different thing. And by the way, we have to fear the language of America first, because it has a history for us. And I don't want to be political. I'm just saying, once you understand what America first represented in 1938, 39, and 40, when somebody says America first, I get chills up and down my spine. Lindbergh was a great hero. Lindbergh was a great pioneer. And he would have led America in precisely the wrong way. We would have been a radically different country in a radically different world. And uh, it would not have been good to be a Jew there or to be a Jew here. And that's the kindest thing I can say about uh, Charles Lindbergh. Yes, sir. Let me begin by saying the, let, let's go back, uh, I'm going to answer you in a, in a short, long way. One of the great achievements of the world, we thought, occurred in December of 1948. A man by the name of Raphael Lemkin got the world community really under leadership in part of Eleanor Roosevelt and a man by the name of René Casson, who was a French-Jewish survivor of the Holocaust, to pass the Genocide Convention. Gen and the second thing that was passed a day later was the, uh, and passed with Ameri by a segregationist America and by a Stalinist Soviet Union was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Lemkin naively believed that if you outlawed genocide, it would be a crime and therefore it would not happen. And one of the problems with, and it indicates all the elements of genocide, which is the murder, the murder of civilians, creating conditions in which they cannot live, and killing people because they are a member of a group. And this is the problem in whole or in part. And the problem in whole or in part as a definition is it doesn't say in what part and how many and how much. There is no doubt that Russia is committing crimes against humanity, as defined by the Nuremberg laws, by the Nuremberg uh, uh, indictments, crimes against humanity, and it's also creating war crimes. Whether indeed its goal is the annihilation of the Ukrainian people 
or the destruction of the Ukrainian state and Ukrainian identity is a matter of dispute. But I don't want us to think that something's not horrifically evil, even if it's not genocide in the strictest terms. It is, ironically, if you say in whole or in part, it is genocide because some people are being murdered merely because they're Ukrainians. But we can't let that be the, maxim, the threshold below which we don't act and after which we only do act. And what's happening here is, again, the Ukraine and their Ukraine has been the subject of killing for the entirety of the 20th century and uh, also of the Holodomor, which was the starvation. And this is why the one optimistic thing we have is the grain that they have allowed to um, come out of the Ukraine because the Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. It's the reason Hitler wanted to conquer the Ukraine. And it now is the breadbasket of the world. And the interesting thing in terms of Putin's uh, policy is that he's going to probably try to um, break Europe by freezing it this winter and making heating and uh, gasoline prohibitively expensive. But he didn't dare turn the world into famine. Because with famine, there are revolutions all over the world, and he doesn't know what he might set off with that. His strategy now is to terrorize Ukrainian and to essentially see if the policy can break, if the policy can actually break um, the will of Europe to combat it. And Europe essentially understands that the fate of Europe is at stake if you begin to invade European territory. And this is one of the reasons why we have a strong response. It's probably one of the reasons why the United States Congress will pass aid to Ukraine now in this lame duck session and not run the risk of what will happen in the next session, uh, given the divided government. But remember, if I'm challenging the question, how much is it a capital G or a small g, that doesn't mean that anything short of genocide is not horrific, terrible, miserable, out, out, outrageous, evil, awful. I'm just a pain in the posterior historian who's looking at the question, how did you define it and why did you define it? And we can come to different judgments on that. But don't take it as acceptance of what's happening or the absence of horror. Other questions? Yes, sir. Let me uh, give you a third phrase. The same man who said the pessimists left, the optimists died, said when it came to rescue, the optimists were not heard and the pessimists controlled the day. Meaning that when it came to rescue, they said nothing could be done and the optimists said we have to do something, anything, and the pessimists won the day in terms of that. I have to tell you, uh, and I, I have to tell you, I feel much better today than I did last week. <laughs> and I have to also tell you that uh, as much as I feel better as an American, I feel upset with the results of the Israeli election because uh, I, I knew Mayor Kahana 
and I know what he represented, and I had a conversation with him many years ago. By the way, when I knew him, he was also for a period of time Marty Cahan, living with the Schicks in Manhattan. So he wasn't, he wasn't, exact, he wasn't exactly Mr. Piety. I said that to him one day, I said, uh, and I was one of a number of people, I said, you're not terribly dangerous in America because the moment you overstep your bounds, America will tell you where to get off. If you ever go to Israel, you're, you're, you're catastrophically dangerous because a majority people has to understand the limits of that it has to observe in order to protect minority rights. And if you only advocate Jewish rights, you're in danger in Israel because somebody has to protect the rights of those who are not Jewish. And that's the danger. Um, I believe that we have two types of anti-Semitism today. One type has the potential of being violent. The other type has the deep potential of being annoying and politically disturbing. The anti-Semitism that we have is the people who want, the, on, on the right, is the people who want to create a Christian nation. There's been some good news on that front. The good news on that front is several fold. Number one, we have seen in the public reaction on the issue of abortion that there are limits on that, and I'm looking at Kansas and Kentucky rather than even Michigan and certainly not California, because it says that, there, that, that there's a limitation on that, and we certainly are not going to get from the populace, and remember the role, role in Mississippi a couple of years ago, you're not going to get from the populace the notion of, of um, conception at birth, that uh, life begins at birth, and by the way, the reason for that, you're not going to get it even from the populace, is because that creates a massive problem for in vitro fertilization. And there are probably in excess of a million kids who are desired, deeply and profoundly desired, who are created every year by in vitro fertilization. And if you say life begins at conception, then what do you do with the fertilized eggs and how long are you responsible for keeping them, and how many generations, and all of that with the fertilized eggs, and the whole constituency of in vitro fertilization, who have parents who loved them, who wanted them, who went through all sorts of efforts in order to conceive them, that's the moment at which a whole range of other things are going to happen. The other thing that we've seen yesterday and today which is equally remarkable and a problem for the Christian nationalists is we've just seen the Senate um, uh, essentially go over 62 to 37 with regard to gay marriage. And you also saw the Church of Latter-day Saints say, as long as you have religious exemptions, we'll go with gay marriage. And you also had that today from the Orthodox Union of Jews which said again that with religious um, restriction, with religious carve-outs, we can go along with that. Uh, and that already tells us something about what for all of us is the greatest transformation in attitudes we've seen in our adult life. Imagine for a moment, and my wife uh, taught here the year of integration of the public school systems. If integration were um, of the public high school, if integration were accepted like that in that type of transformation, we would have been a radically different nation. So you have a couple of major cracks in the Christian nationalist front. You also have a couple of cracks now in the election denier front. And let me, again, I'm going to give you a 30-second lecture, and every other question will be answered as shortly. <laughs> if you want to know something about anti-Semitism, I said this at dinner tonight, so I'm going to repeat it, and, and maybe the second time even I'll understand it. Anti-Semitism differs as to its source. Religious, economic, political, 
social, and in the Nazi case, racial. It differs, secondly, as to its goal. Religious anti-Semitism wants conversion. Racial anti-Semitism wanted what the Nazis called extermination, what we might call annihilation. Economic anti-Semitism means you want to what limit Jewish economic power. Political anti-Semitism can ultimately lead to expulsion, but you want to limit Jewish uh, power. We heard that with the, the Jews shall not replace us, etc. Anti-Semitism, so it differs as to its source, it differs as to its goal, it differs as to its priority. One of the reasons Jews have been secure in the United States is not because Americans don't hate, it's because others were hated more. It's a race we do not want to win. The last thing is anti-Semitism is directly correlated to the stability of the society. The less stable a society is, the more dangerous it is for Jews and in America for a whole range of other people. The more stable a society, the more stable it is for Jews. Jews are regarded as the equivalent of a canary in the coal mine. So was I saying, and I'm going to be Political, you'll forgive me, I'm in Florida, maybe they'll shoot me at this point, arrest me, <laughs> who knows. Had we had a second term of Donald Trump, or if we have a second term of Donald Trump, which is not even going to have a B team, it's going to have a C team, then America might be endangered in a way it is not currently endangered. And one would have to take seriously what that represents. Uh, I hope those forces in our society can be defeated. I also hope uh, one of the things that um, I did a film with a Holocaust survivor by the name of Gerda Weissman Klein, great woman who spoke at the Academy Awards. We won an Academy Award with this. And what she said to the Academy Award winners was, the, uh, to the Academy Awards, not the winners, she said, all of you who go home and enjoy the privileges of a boring night at home, you're all winners. And she got a thunderous applause. I hope that society can someday be a little bit boring. Because, and, and by the way, I'm not alone. I think that we've had too much turmoil. And part of what we saw here is a little bit of boringness is not bad. Uh, you know, when, when, I, I, when I call my wife and I say what's happening at home, and she says I don't have to report about any of the kids getting hurt, about any of the grandchildren getting, getting this, that, the other thing. I, I mean, we had... Uh, my, we had this last uh, two weeks ago. They had a false report of the school shooting at my granddad at my granddaughter's school. So the only question was who was closest to get down to the school. And everybody, we're, we're on a, a joint call. Everybody says I'm closest, meaning everybody wants to rush. There probably were a thousand parents down at the school, turned out it was a false alarm, but the school was in lockdown. I want boring. You know, I want to speak to my daughter, and she's, she's saying, you know, I'm cooking tonight, and I'm doing this and that, the other thing. I don't want to hear that my granddaughter, you know, school is in lockdown. And, you know, why'd she call, why'd she call me? Because I was going to hear it and hit the panic button. Rightfully so. I like the fact that a school day is boring. You know, I want the kids to learn something, but I don't want them to learn that. Uh, so we need a stabilization of society. And remember, we are in, have, have experienced multiple crises. We experienced a health crisis, an economic crisis, a political crisis, a crisis of truth. We're experiencing now a, a national crisis in terms of war. We're experiencing inflation in a context of of a variety of other economic symbol, symptoms that are not too bad. But we're also experiencing, and, and this is the optimism of, and I spoke to the kids today, 
the students today and I said, you know, we have now moved to a knowledge-based economy. And power, influence, and affluence in the world is going to be in knowledge. The most important thing that the students have to learn is how to learn. The most important students thing students have to learn is how to learn because they are going to experience things that we do not know in fields that do not exist, in um, manners, and all they need is the confidence that I can learn. I, many years ago, I taught at the Naval Academy, and they had a wonderful ethic. If you, call the, if you ask a question to a midshipman, um, the midshipman would say, do not know, sir, but we'll find out, sir. Because an officer need not know everything, but need not accept ignorance as an acceptable thing. And you had to write that down, and the first thing you had to do in the next class is to call midshipman so-and-so, what did you find out? And I have found that to be a brilliant ethic. I've done that with my students. I keep telling them, this is the ethic. You can't be satisfied with ignorance, but the most important thing is we're in a knowledge-based economy, so those without knowledge, what, are, are handicapped. You're now, in, you're in a university town, great universities in this town. You've seen all the industries that have gone up about, that have gone up about it, all of them using what, knowledge, in fields that didn't exist when we were kids. And we've seen the obsolescence of fields. Right? I can't tell you, you all, some of you remember VHSs. Some of you may even remember Beta. Right? Radio Shack used to be on the forefront of what? Of, techno of technology. And, uh, you know, who knew there was such a thing as the cloud? I thought that was the stuff we looked at, whether it was going to rain or not. So we're dealing with, with the skills that are unimaginable. You have more power here than they made with they had they needed to make the atomic bomb. When I went to the museum, I'm going to end with this. When I went to the museum at, at Los Alamos, they were using an abacus. And think of the power you have here and the power of construction and destruction. Let me conclude by saying thank you for your support for Herc, and thank you for your interest. Good night. Thank you very much for coming. And if you have any more questions, Michael will be happy to talk to you after we're all finished now. And we thank you. And um, we'll be happy to have you next time. We'll, we'll let you know the next program. Thank you.